Rents were soaring, blue-collar workers and low-income folks were being pushed out, and street crime was at an all-time high. It doesn't sound unlike today, but we're actually talking about the San Francisco of 1962. And as part of our 70th anniversary coverage, KPX 5's Elizabeth Cook looks back on a horrible crime and a stunning turn of events. A quiet majesty graces the southwest corner of the United States. Zion National Park, the mysterious rocks at Bryce, and the northern rim of the Grand Canyon. Breathtaking in their beauty, and all in her backyard. It just fills my heart with joy. Her name is April Aaron. For most of her life, she's lived close to these natural wonders. I see God in nature. I feel peace. I feel love. I just feel, I feel at home. But this is not the first time we've met. In 1962, KPIX News captured April on film with a bandaged eye, an arm and leg in a cast as two men carried her up a flight of stairs. 56 years ago, these stairs would take April home to be with her family. At the time, she lived here in the outer sunset of San Francisco. Now, what happened to April, how she got those injuries is absolutely horrifying, but it's what she did afterwards that will take your breath away. I, I never regretted that decision. Mom and dad. At her dining room Melissa, table in Utah, April spread out old dad. newspaper clippings. It was a big, big deal. Joining her, two of her siblings, Scott. Family's huge. And Melissa. I just looked up to her so much. She, I, she was beautiful. I wanted to grow up to be beautiful like my sister. The Aarons were a tightly knit family of devout Mormons, April the eldest and Scott the youngest. In April of 1962, I was a five-year-old in kindergarten. The old headlines tell the story. Park terror, vicious slashing, prayers versus Ripper. The victim of the attack, April. She was just 22. I was going to a, a church dance. The dance was at her church, a Mormon chapel then located on Hayes Street. We had gone to Disneyland over the last few days and we got home late and I lost my ride that I usually went with. And so I decided to take the bus. She got off the bus at Masonic and crossed the Panhandle near Golden Gate Park. The church was just a few blocks away. All of a sudden, I realized I was being followed. From behind, she heard a man's voice saying, come here, babe. I just started running. I ran as fast as I could. He chased me for a block and a half and caught me just a couple of doors down from the church. And that's when he started uh, slashing me with a butcher knife, they said. I ended up lying on the ground with um, 11 major cuts, uh, nine into the bone. Lost an eye, almost lost an arm and a leg. Meanwhile, back at home. I had gone up to my bedroom and mom had gone up to hers and then dad came home. And then the phone rang. I could see that something was terribly wrong. The next day when I woke up, the feeling around the house was much different than it was when I went to bed the night before. Um, I remember feeling just this heaviness. The knife was razor sharp. As to his motive, it almost seemed like he was just crazy. April needed a prosthetic eye. Doctors told her she would never walk again. Now, a previously undisclosed detail. In the hospital, April received unsigned letters from her assailant threatening to kill her. He said, I hate you. I'm tired of seeing you in the headlines. The next time you're going to be in the headlines will be of your death. The police stood guard at her door. A police sketch from witnesses showed the suspect, a young black man. Officers questioned young black men around the city, stoking racial tensions. The suspect remained at large. I was so frightened. The situation grew tense. One night, her father snapped. He said they were going to buy guns and find, then kill the man who hurt her. When he said that, my heart broke. Sorry, my family is so important to me, as I've mentioned before. Such a close family that <clears throat> all I could think of is what is happening to my family. That's when April had an epiphany, a revelation. And I was able to forgive him, and I said, Dad, we have to forgive this man. Vengeance is in God's hands, not ours. 
Her message of forgiveness hit all the papers. During a police lineup, April recognized a voice, but not the face. She refused to make a positive ID. And I wasn't going to send someone to prison that I wasn't sure was the one. I just couldn't do it. When April left the hospital, her medical and hospital bills were staggering. Well-wishers paid them off. As for those men, they were actually the police officers assigned to her case. Her baby brother, Scott, jumped on the bed and gave her a kiss. To get my sister home, everyone was very happy that, you know, she was healing. I have seen other families whose children have suffered at the hands of someone else live out their lives in bitterness. And thanks to April, we didn't do that at all. Despite the odds, April did walk again. She now speaks at prisons and jails about the power of forgiveness. The man was never caught. I believe that I was spared uh, and that I was healed so that I could live my life out and do the things that I've been able to do in my life. Life is good. April married, has five daughters, 16 grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren. We're very, very close. As for these national monuments, their beauty was created through adversity. Harsh winds, driving rains, slicing ice, rushing waters. For April, it was another kind of adversity that created a more awesome beauty, the one in her heart. In Utah, Elizabeth Cook, KPIX 5. As Liz mentioned, the case was never solved. KPIS, though, did want to take a look at the old police file, but the police told us that because of the statute of limitations, the file was destroyed. April says she didn't mind, but she has written a memoir about that experience.